Well, welcome to this episode of Brain Ponderings. I'm Mark Matson, the host. And today we're going to talk about really exciting, potentially very important from the standpoint of brain health and Alzheimer's disease and maybe other neurodegenerative disorders, a potential intervention that may be of benefit. And this is these are emerging findings by Professor Li Wei Tsai, uh, professor at MIT, where she's also director of the very well-known Pickauer Institute for Learning and Memory. And she's um, also, I guess there's a couple new initiatives up there she's involved in. One is a aging brain initiative and another in Down syndrome, which it turns out uh, if you look at the brains of, of people who have died with Down syndrome, the pathology in their brains is very similar, pretty much the same as Alzheimer's disease. So there's something going on in Down syndrome that's similar to Alzheimer's disease, although Down's is a genetic problem. So, um, Li Wei, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. I guess the last time has been when you came to the National Institute on Aging and gave a talk. Oh, uh, wow. Now, that was know. quite a while ago. 15 years ago? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Um, and so Li Wei has a, a very interesting kind of pathway to what she's doing now that has, she's moved all the way now to clinical trials of an intervention. She'll talk about gamma stimulation, but it started out, you know, I look, of course, look back at where she started and she started studying proteins that regulate the cell cycle, the, the division of cells. And I think it was relevant to cancer research. Absolutely. Yeah, I have a very convoluted uh, career path, as you said. Uh, to neuroscience. Um, I was born and raised in Taiwan. Um, and, you know, I didn't have a lot of opportunities to be exposed to laboratory research. Um, and then after I finished um, education there, I just, you know, couldn't decide what I wanted to do. So I, um, I came to the U.S., um, got an opportunity to work in a lab, and I just absolutely fell in love with research. And I immediately knew um, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I applied for a PhD program and got accepted into uh, a cancer research lab at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, where I study um, growth factors, and oncogenes that promote tumor cell growth. Um, and then, you know, of course, I was in the cancer world. Um, I, I apply at that time to a leading laboratory in cancer research um, and, uh, for postdoctoral training. And uh, I was accepted to start my work uh, with Ed Harlow at Cosmin Harbor Laboratories. And then later on, the lab relocated to Mass General Hospital. Um, so that that was, you know, the year of 1990 when I arrived in Boston. And, um, and you know, I was involved in identifying uh, cell cycle-related kinases. At the time, you know, cloning was still a big thing. And people were still identifying new genes. That was before the genomic era. And, um, and I did identify a particular kinase uh, called cycling dependent kinase 5. Um, and it has very unusual properties. Um, you know, I was using at the time kinase assays. Um, and I just couldn't detect active kinase activity in any of the cancer cell lines. Um, so, you know, I was determined to see whether this is a real enzyme or not. So I actually dissected an animal, a mouse, and then took out all the different organs, including the brain, and then, um, and then perform a kinase assay. And then I was just shocked to see that the only 
tissue that show um, detectable uh, activity is the brain. And, so, and you didn't you didn't have antibodies to CDK5 at that time, or I did, I did. So yeah. I used antibody coupled with you know kinase assay. So I immunoprecipitated uh, the kinase and I then see. performed a in vitro kinase assay. Um, so that really you know set off the rest of my career. You know, I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more, and also at the time. Um, my uh, postdoctoral uh, supervisor assigned me to collaborate with a uh, neurologist, Bern Cavanus, um, to look at brain development. Um, so that really led me to the realm of uh, neuroscience. And I was just so fascinated by the brain. So by the time I was looking for a junior faculty position, I basically told everyone that I'm going to do uh, neuroscience research. Despite the fact that I had no background, uh, I was trained as a cancer uh, researcher, but I actually got offers. Um, it was fascinating. And um, and I, you know, I started um, uh, my own lab at Harvard Medical School, and I was able to get funding from the NIH, NSF, um and so on so so yeah so 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 i will always remember that um and then and leeway then you you will start identifying i think an, a number of substrates for the this kinase that yeah that yeah you know, it, these, you know it, so several this, years later yeah, my lab was doing well studying brain development and CDK5 uh, and its regulatory activator P35. They are very important for cortical development, neuronal migration, axon development. But then several years later, um, a student of mine, you know, I realized that there could be a smaller species of P35. You know, it's about 25 kilodalton. And then we realized that this species actually is associated with neurodegeneration. Um, and that was really a transition of my lab from studying brain development to studying neurodegeneration uh, and into Alzheimer's disease. And also a lot of the, the proteins you, you found were phosphorylated by CDK5 were cytoskeletal proteins. Yeah, especially right. the tau protein. Um, so CDK5 is also known as a tau kinase too. Um, so um, so so yeah, and then yeah. several other cytoskeletal proteins, other microtubule associated proteins. Um, so you know that was when I you know I get to know Alzheimer's disease, and I would just say at that time. I I feel that Alzheimer's disease um is um on the cusp of something. You know, it's a disease ripe for discoveries. Um, they're very well defined pathological features. So when you design any assays, you know precisely what to look, you know, such as tau phosphorylation or protein aggregation increase amyloid production and so on so that so so the biomarkers are very well defined yeah. um so you know so so my feeling at the time was that if i you know if we studying alzheimer's disease there may be a chance we can make meaningful uh contributions to this very devastating um brain disorder there was also you know a <laughs> I was looking through your publications and, um, okay, so in cancer, from a therapeutic standpoint, we want to be able to selectively kill the cancer cell. From a neurodegenerative standpoint, we want to keep the cells alive, right? So these cell, the, the mechanisms involved in cell survival and death are similar in neurons and cancer cells, there are some differences. For example, P53, right? This classic uh, 
protein that's involved in you know death cell death and it's mutated in a lot of cancers it can uh, cause the death of neurons as well and then we actually worked on the one protein par four yeah yeah which there was a, a lab at kentucky where i was then that was working on cancer and they discovered this par that's called prostate apoptosis response four you know, and it was being studied in the cancer field. And then we had some evidence using what's now very archaic technology, antisense oligonucleotides and, you know, getting them into cultured neurons and had some evidence that was involved in drew. But let's, let's move to the really uh, exciting part from a therapeutic standpoint of your work, which is has to do with gamma frequency. I've had previous podcasts. I had um, Uri Busaki recently. I actually had Wolf Singer as well on one of my podcasts. Wow, and fantastic. So, you know, so in previous episodes, my guests have talked a little bit about EEG, electroencephalogram, and there's these different frequencies of oscillations you can see. And you know, low frequency, and then the higher frequency is gamma. And can you talk about kind of historically how you got interested in gamma frequency and, and its potential importance in, I guess, in normal brain function and then in Alzheimer's disease? Great question. Um, I'm so glad you already... Uh, had uh, Wolf Singer and Yuri Bushaki uh, participated in um, in your podcast, and they're clearly, you know, giants in the field um, in terms of uh, synchrony um, and um, how you know what kind of role or potential role, right? Um, a lot of um, the work. Um, it, based on electrophysiology and computational analysis, um, a lot of beautiful, beautiful um, conceptual kind of um, advances. Um, and I think from their work, you know, um, um, especially Wolf Singer, um, you know, proposed that this um, higher frequency um, um, uh, synchrony really plays a key role in binding um, neurons in different brain regions to facilitate um, routing of information yeah. to desirable regions and very higher order brain functions. Um, so, um, you know, um, when um, I relocated my laboratory to MIT, um, um, in 2006, around that time, a very important uh, neurotechnology um, was reported, which is optogenetics, mm. um, a nature neuroscience paper published by uh, Carl Dasras and uh, Ed Boyden. They show for the first time that, that you can, you know, sort of manipulate neural activity, right? using um, this uh, opsin um, uh, expression in neurons and, and using light. I think we keep Sorry, every, oct every October recently, I've been waiting for, for Carl to get Nobel Prize, right? I mean, it's very important technology. Yeah, very important, you know, revolutionize how, you know, we do neuroscience research. Mm -hmm. So around that time, um, uh, there uh, was a colleague at MIT, uh, Christopher Moore, um, and uh, he, you know, and I, um, along with at the time uh, postdoctoral researchers uh, Jessica Carding, uh, Marie Carlin, and um, uh, Constantinos Meletus, um, we just, you know, we were excited about this new shiny new. Um, a tool that we can use. So we really wanted to use that tool to answer some, you know, and answer questions. And one question is, you know, how is um, 
you know, say gamma oscillations, um, all the different oscillations uh, controlled uh, in the brain and what type of neurons are responsible for this. So, um, so we decided to specifically introduce uh, channel rhodopsin 2 into either the um, PAV albumin positive fast spiking interneurons or into the regular spiking neurons. So the so-called regular spiking neurons, they are the excitatory neurons. Uh, so just a just a kind of a go. So channel rhodopsin two is essentially a sodium channel that can be activated uh, by light. So sodium rushes in and depolarizes this. So. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you, Mark. So so we introduced them into this fast spiking cells or the excitatory neuron. They are regular known as regular spiking cells. And then we initially just use, you know, a broad band of, you know, sort of different frequencies of uh, laser light, because we would then implant, uh, implanted this fiber optic into, you know, the desirable burn region. And in that study, it was the somatosensory cortex. And then we use the laser light uh, to activate the channel dopsin 2, either in pop albumin positive neurons or in the regular spiking neurons. And then we saw something highly unexpected. So uh, while, you know, when we drive this uh, regular spiking excitatory neurons, we see that, you know, they mainly peak like around eight to 10 Hertz. Okay. okay. Uh, when we drive the pop albumin positive neurons, they peak around 40 to 50 Hertz, huh. okay? And that's when we realized that this pop albumin positive neurons, they are likely to be the most important neuronal type that drive um, this uh, low gamma frequency uh, synchrony in the brain. So um, so that was published, you know, it was a very well received uh, publication. And I remember Carl's lab, um, they also publish a paper on the pop albumin neurons and um, and gamma uh, synchrony um, in the same um, issue of uh, the 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 journal Nature Journal. And, and, and there's uh, there's some evidence from you know looking at post mortem Alzheimer's brain that these these inhibitory neurons they use GABA as a transmitter that they may degenerate actually pretty early. In the disease, yeah, process. and in fact, uh, uh, and latest... what and what happened, Li Wei? The my interpretation is what happened was, you know, when you look at the brain and you you stain for the neurofibrillary tangles, right? Mm -hmm. For the hyperphosphorylated tau, the most conspicuous neurons are the these big pyramidal right. shaped neurons, and these these smaller GABA neurons they're less conspicuous, so I think. People just kind of, you know, until more recently in the early days, they kind of dismissed that these inhibitory neurons were actually degenerating too. Not just that, right? They are way um, fewer. They are less abundant. Um, mm -hmm. And there are many different types of interneurons too. So they are more um, complicated yeah. um, to look at. Yeah. Um, but you are absolutely right. These um, interneurons, they are actually more susceptible to neuronal toxicity. Um, and in and, fact- and it, it actually makes some sense though, because they're, if you just like record their spontaneous activity, they, they're firing like crazy. Right. They have a really high energy demand. They're, right. They've got a, you know, they're depolarizing, repolarizing, calcium's going in, they got to get it out. You know, so it makes sense that, you know, with aging, that everything that declines, you know, it, with aging, you know, mitochondrial function declines, you know, a, a lot of thing, problems going on. Maybe that's in part why they're particularly vulnerable. Yeah, but then, you know, now it also makes sense if you think about it. When this interneurons they degenerate 
or you know they just don't function normally anymore, then it really affects the synchrony in the brain. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so a very important question is you know whether you know <clears throat> the synchrony has something to do with neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease, and um. And so, so at that time, there's already kind of body or literature um, in both human subjects and in um, Alzheimer's disease mouse models that people show, um, you know, abnormal gamma oscillations um, okay. in uh, a number of these animal models, amyloid models, um, tau models, uh, even a, a humanized APOE4. Um, model and also in human patients there are quite a lot of uh reports i mean in humans it's all mixed okay um but mm -hmm. then a, a young graduate student joined my lab um and she told me that you know the the one purpose i want to come to your lab is to look at gamma oscillations in alzheimer's disease and specifically I want to know if I enhance gamma oscillations using optogenetic method, whether you know it will have any you know positive effects yeah. um, in animal models. Wow, so that, that really some, started the whole thing. That's some graduate student that already yeah. has an idea what they want to do. They, you know, Hannah Alcarino, she knew exactly what she wanted. So, um, so yeah, so we started the whole experiment. We um, just like what we did before, we know exactly what to do. We introduced chenorhodopsin 2 into the pulp albumin positive uh, interneurons in a amyloid um, Alzheimer's model. Um, and then, you know, we, we um, activated this uh, pulp albumin cells in the hippocampus of, of this 5-CPD model. And, um, and you know, then the question is, what should we look for, right? Um, and um, and also very importantly, I should mention, you know, in order to do in vivo electrophysiology, at the time we uh, started a collaboration with Annabelle Singer, uh, who was a postdoctoral fellow in avoidance lab. Mm. Um, and Annabelle now is a faculty at the Georgia Tech um running her own lab so we knew that you know we could perfectly you know activate gamma synchrony uh even in the 5 cfd mice using optogenetics and um so eventually um hannah decided to um you know look at amyloid because this mouse they really have this amyloid um yeah. pathology so what she did was to look at soluble uh, A-beta peptides, A-beta-40 and A-beta-42 uh, mm -hmm. using ELISA. And um, I, I still remember that day she got a result. She ran down the hallway into my, into my office and she just showed me, you know, the ELISA play assay, right? It's an enzymatic mm -hmm. color metric um, reaction. The term, and term I can blue. clearly see Turn red, I mean, turn yellow or turn blue, they're different, you know, different uh -huh. brands, different colors. And I look at those wells. I know there are some wells, they are clear, there are some wells, they are much, you know, more color. And she told me the clear wells are the lysate from mice with optogenetic stimulation at gamma frequency. I'm, a, I'm like, and I said, wow, are you sure? You didn't mess up the samples, you know. And then so, you know, I mean, we repeated, repeated. And how, how long were they stimulated? For what time? It's, oh, okay, sorry. So um, one hour. Huh. Wow. One hour. Acute one hour stimulation. And by ELISA, we look at soluble beta, we saw huge differences. And so... There was some, I remember like way back, some early studies, I think Roger Nietzsche, that he stimulated hippocampal slices. And I thought his early evidence was that, okay, so the 
Amyloid yeah. beta peptide is cleaved out of the amyloid precursor protein by two enzymes. Yep. You know, beta and gamma secretase. But there's another enzyme called alpha secretase that cleaves in the middle of the amyloid beta peptide. And, you know, we actually did a lot of work on these secreted forms of APP alpha. So do you think, what what do you think the mechanism, do you think this gamma stimulation is, for example, enhancing alpha secretase cleavage or or inhibiting beta or gamma secretase? Do you know, Mark, I think there could be effects on amyloid production, but I think the, um, you know, it's especially as you pointed out, even just with one hour, uh, we could already see a difference. Yeah. It is more about clearance. Okay. Much more than oh, I see. In production. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, so at the time we got that result. <laughs> And um and I show the results to you know my colleagues at the Picard Institute, and um and I remember particularly um Emery Brown, who is a physician scientist. Um, he looked at the data and he said, "This is very impressive, and this could have implications in in human patients." But he said, "You know, optogenetics is very invasive." And um, and I don't really think you can do this to Alzheimer's patients. Mm -hmm. So he said, can you think of a way that's, you know, less invasive, but you can control the synchrony of cells in the brain? So um, so so we agree with him. So he actually very nice. He's super busy person, but he sat down with me. And Hannah, we you know look through the literatures in synchrony and and then came up came up with one paper published by Wolf Singer. It was a paper in the early eighties. Eighties. It's very early. It's an old piece of literature, but what they show was fascinating. So they use light flicker presented at different frequencies to cap. And then they did in vivo local field potential recordings from the visual cortex of the cat. Mm -hmm. And basically their conclusions is that they see an absolute correspondence between the stimulating frequency and the recording frequency. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you use 10 Hertz light flicker, um, then you record a 10 Hertz uh, synchrony. Um, in uh, increase in 10 hertz power in the uh, visual cortex. So then, you know, they went all the way from, you know, zero hertz to 50 hertz, and they see, you know, a straight line of um, of correspondence. So we look at a paper, we're like, whoa, we can just use perhaps sensory stimulation um, to manipulate how neurons fire in the brain. So we immediately set up um, uh, a protocol to treat mice with a uh, light flicker. So we basically, you know, put the mouse in the cage and then surrounded the cage with uh, LED light strip. And then we use a very simple Arduino code to drive the LED lights to flicker at different frequencies. And I think the rest is history, Mark. I couldn't believe it. I everything was still just like yesterday, um, but those experiments happened almost a decade ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was um, it was amazing. We found that mice responded to light flicker just just like cats. Um, you know, if we presented them with forty hertz flicker, we could see forty hertz oscillations. Um, and that, and, and also not only in the visual cortex, right? Also, in yeah, that is a very important point I will get into. But first of all, we show you know um, the sensory light flicker induced um, oscillations power 
can also lead to similar reduction of amyloid uh, soluble peptides after one hour uh, of treatment. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and so that was our first publication pretty much. And in that publication, we already show um, it's not just the neurons that responded to this um, uh, flicker stimulation, but we also found by immunohistochemistry and RNA sequencing that microglia somehow responded robustly. Mm -hmm. uh, we found that microglia undergo, underwent dramatic morphological changes. Their cell body became much bigger. They seemed to be much more ready to, um, to do phagocytosis. Um, and it was just, it's, it was amazing. So that and was the first presuma, paper. Presuma, is, is the microglial effect mediated by neuronal activity or is it? Yes, that's what, that's what we believe, that microglia responded to neuronal activity or secretive factors. Um, ah. but, but then later on, we realized that it's not just microglia, basically all the glial cells um, and the vasculature responded to, you know, this 40 hertz synchrony of neurons. Yeah, the vasculature thing, I, I was reading your work on that. Um, okay, so it's kind of important to distinguish like short-term effects that are happening very quickly after, you know, one, uh, one hour session versus you know, repeated over days and days and weeks and months. But so you saw, you've seen increased angiogenesis or? No. Not so, angiogenesis. So what we saw, so in the subsequent paper, um, papers, what we found, first of all, is that it's not just a light flicker. If we present the animal with sound clicks uh, presented at the gamma frequency, um, it also can induce increased gamma power um, in different regions of the brain, like auditory cortex, hippocampus, um, and also can lead to a reduction of amyloid. But we also found that if we combine light and sound together, it's the most powerful. First uh -huh. of all, the synchrony just hmm. propagates throughout, you know, almost the entire brain um, and um, and with, you know, as you say, repeated daily one hour of stimulation, um, we saw a lot of um, beneficial effects. Um, we saw not just reduction of amyloid in the tau model, we saw this dramatic reduction of uh, tau, phosphorylated tau pathology, um, actually, the reduction of phosphor tau is um, remarkable, I would say. And also with, you know, we... So it's, it's not just, you know, s slowing down or stopping the accumulation of the phosphor tau. It's actually, are the neurons getting rid of the phosphor tau? I think so. So, um, so the neurons actually after... So with one hour per day, several weeks of treatment, um, in several different neurodegeneration models, we saw reduced neuronal loss and increased synaptic density. So, um, and we also perform more, you know, transcriptomic RNA sequencing analysis. So what we saw is in neurons, and actually, literally all the cell types we look at, we see, you know, the most dramatic changes in the the gene ontology terms in terms of pathways is um, intracellular trafficking, membrane tra trafficking, vesicular trafficking. Um, yeah. So I think in neurons, probably what happened is actually, you know, enhanced endocytosis, lysosomal function, ah. um, autophagy. Ah. So I think that is the mm -hmm. mechanism how it makes neurons healthy yeah. again and reducing like a protein aggregates, aggregation. Um, and also this process also enhances neuron to release 
uh, factors that can influence uh, glial cells and, and the vasculature. You know, one, one, we did a lot of work on various neurotrophic factors, proteins that are released from neurons and other cells that promote gr growth and survival and stress resistance. And, you know, my experiments, at least in the cultured hippocampal neurons, the most profound effects were with fibroblast growth factor 2, FGF2. Oh, Right. I think it would, you know, there's been a lot of focus on BDNF. And I don't know if you get a chance, it would be good to look into FGF2. FGF2 because, what because about it, um, it has effects. It has, you know, so it promotes neuron survival, outgrowth of axons and dendrites. On, um, and then, it, but it also promotes angiogenesis and has, uh, you know, many other effects on other cell types. Yeah, I think I think gamma really, you know, enable neurons to produce a lot of trophy factors, uh, neuropeptides that are beneficial, um, probably hormones too, uh, depending mm -hmm. on what type of neurons um, are um, recruited. Um, and in terms of the vascular effects that you asked earlier, uh, what we saw is that we see a bigger diameter of the vasculature, especially the capillaries. Uh -huh. And we also did some two photon imaging. And what we saw is that the velocity of the blood flow is increased. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know that in some of the um, Alzheimer's mouse model, like the amyloid model, you can see in the capillaries, some regions, you know, the blood basically, the blood flow basically stalled. Um, but mm -hmm. but with the gamma simulation, the the stalling is uh, pretty much ameliorated. Um, so I think that this is um, really something that's beneficial because, you know, if you have blood circulation stall, you can see that's going to cause a lot of problems. So, so right right now in your brain and my brain, right, these neural circuits that are involved in us focusing on what we're talking about, there's increased blood flow, right? So there's increased neural activity in those neurons. There's increased blood flow. So what... I guess what ha in the human brain is gamma gamma oscillations increase like right now would they be increased in our brains because we're engaging in intellectual this intellectually challenging conversation and what other kinds of things for example exercise sleep you mentioned clearance of the amyloid protein there's this evidence from well initial Mike and I actually had Mike and on one of my podcasts on the glymphatic system. Yeah. But so I guess what's kind of the lay of the land as far as what's the correlation be between what the brain is doing and the gamma oscillations? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Um, gamma oscillation is known to be activated, um, you know, during like a working memory, you know, sort of you know, active, you know, you are really using your brain uh, intensely, such as, you know, you are beating a deadline, you know, tomorrow you have to submit your NIH proposal. Your gamma is definitely very active uh, trying to get your proposal uh, finished or during exams, tests. Um, but also, as you say, in at least in the literature, exercise, can also increase gamma oscillations. And one more thing, I think a lot of people ask me about this. So there are some literature on meditation. Oh. Apparently people who really can do meditation at a very high level, their brain has high levels of gamma oscillations. Um, that's so intri That's intriguing, right? Because it, I kind of think of meditation as like the opposite of, you know, working intensely on a grant proposal. <laughs> to, uh, but you know, in both there's 
both seem to be good for the brain, right? Yeah, yeah. But one thing I want to say is spontaneous gamma oscillations, they are always like a burst of activity, oh. okay? You see a burst of gamma, I but see. it never persists. It comes down and, and stuff like that. But with this sensory stimulation, light and sound treatment, basically what you see, say from the EEG recordings or electro um, uh, recordings directly from the brain, what you see is a persistent elevation of gamma power for the entire duration of the stimulation period. So I think that is why I think it can be very powerful, whatever about chemical consequences, this triggers, it lasted for the entire hour. So thus far, you've talked about how, you know, multiple animal models of that are relevant to Alzheimer's disease or I guess this other disorder, frontotemporal lobe dementia. You've seen this gamma stimulation is beneficial in terms of the pathology. You didn't mention it, but you've also looked at with the long-term treatment, you've looked at learning and memory. Oh, yeah. Which yeah, it definitely improves uh, learning and memory in multiple animal models, too. And that's very robust. And then I also saw somewhere, so are you look, have you, have you looked in a Down syndrome model? Oh, yeah. So um, we definitely, um, we have several projects on the Down syndrome models. Mm -hmm. And one of them, um, we have a manuscript that, you know, we would like to, you know, uh, submit very soon. Um, we use this uh, TS65DN uh, Down syndrome model. Um, and, um, and we um, found that um, this uh, light and sound treatment chronically, you know, one hour per day for several weeks, um promotes um neurogenesis it's a uh, mm -hmm. very surprising to me um because i'm sure you know maybe you have a podcast on adult neurogenesis um yes. so so now i think people have shown even in humans uh the hippocampus can continue to produce new neurons throughout life and um and this um, ability seems to be more impaired during aging and certainly in Alzheimer's disease, uh, but Down syndrome also has impaired neurogenesis. And um, we show that this stimulation can uh, improve adult neurogenesis, also can improve um, some learning and memory behavioral uh, performance. Um, yeah, so, so we're trying to get this paper published. Oh, I should say, um, yeah, so I guess we should mention this now before you get to the clinical part where you've done initial clinical trials in, in patients with, I guess, early or moderate Alzheimer's. Uh, full disclosure, so you, you're a co-founder of a company called Cognito? Cognito Therapeutics. So yeah. Ed Boyden and I are co-scientific founders of the company. And that's involved in making, uh, well, it's in supporting clinical trials, but also in actually making um, devices that can deliver these kinds of specific 40 hertz frequency stimulation to people. So the idea is down the road, this could be an inexpensive way to help people. Kind of like, you know, I actually had... Um, a few years ago, I had an accident and had three surgeries and then oh. a lot of pain issues. Then I found out I actually have a peripheral neuropathy caused by a mutation in a voltage-dependent sodium channel. That's oh, wow. It's a gain-of-function mutation. Anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting story. But um, So anyway... Uh, I started to get depressed after this accident because I couldn't mainly mainly because I couldn't exercise much. And I previously I, you know, I was like an exercise, did a lot of running, mountain bike riding. So I got depressed. And then now I'm exercising again. So I'm 
Uh, but I have every morning I have a light box. A simple okay. thing, especially this time of year, right? When the daylight, simple thing, it's very well established that exposure to full spectrum light uh, in the morning can improve your mood. And it, it's yes. a treat. So that's a simple, inexpensive. So this is what you're where you're the direction you're going uh, with this, right? Absolutely. But I think that really to convince people to use it seriously, I think a well-controlled clinical trial is necessary. Yeah. I think it is necessary to get FDA approval yeah. so that people know using this device yeah. um, really can benefit the disease. Yeah. So that's the main reason, um, you know, uh, we think that a company is necessary to get this done. You know, we are academic lab. We really can't do no. No. human trials. So. No. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And yeah, this is great. And so you you want to talk about go through your like your phase one and phase two trial. Um kind yeah, of, of course. That. You, you had a paper yeah, about we a, about we, a year year ago it came out. Yeah, so actually, you know, I just want to make it very clear first before I talk about uh Carnito's trial. So um so at MIT. We also have a small team of physicians and um, engineers and scientists who now work with human subjects. Okay. And um, and our purpose is not so much of you know doing this kind of large scale clinical trial to get FDA approval. No, but we really want to experiment in humans and really further understand the mechanism uh, and uh, you know get to know whether whatever uh, we observe yeah. in mice yeah. in terms of mechanisms whether that also happen in humans yeah. so it's a mechanistic study um but carnito therapeutics their main purpose is to get fda approval so they are doing you know just large number yeah. of trials um so let me, you know, maybe talk a little bit yeah. about our MIT um, study first before I mention Carnito. Okay. So as you say, last year we published a, um, a paper um, reporting a very small trial of 15 uh, subjects of early stage Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, but even though it's a very small number of subjects, it's a, you know, double blind controlled, um, uh, clinical um, study. Um, so we have half of them on the active 40 hertz light and sound treatment, which we use a um, LED light box, two foot by two foot, um, filled with hundreds of LED lights. And then also a um, a sound bar to deliver the, the, the auditory on stimulation. So what we do is we install this uh, device in their home or in their nursing home. Uh, so their caregivers can, you know, sort of, you know, help them turning this on every day. Uh, we also have an eye tracking device embedded in that device. So mm -hmm. we get to monitor from remote, you know, huh whether they actually turn this on and whether their eyes are looking at the light box or not. So we, we can get a lot of information from these people. We also have actigraphy um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, device, so we get to know their daily activity and, and, and so on. So- And, the, and the, light, the light and the sound are synchronized, right? Yes, yes, yeah. 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 So, um, so that trial initially we wanted to um, to conclude after nine months of daily treatment, um, and the plan was to evaluate them at you know when they came in, and then three months after treatment, and then nine months time point, and then at that time we would start the so called open label extension, so everybody get to to be switched to the active uh, treatment. 
And had had you had you already shown in humans that this you know light and sound forty gamma does actually cause the synchronization in the brains? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the initial kind of testing in you know initially in young people, young healthy people, and then older people, and then Alzheimer's people. Okay. We show that that can induce gamma synchrony yep. in all of these people. Okay. Um and 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 so so I wanted to say first of all we found that this long term treatment daily treatment is very safe. Uh, there's no side effect as far as we know. And um, but well, one one thing I thought about so, right? So I have a light on in my room, right? And mm -hmm. that's flickering at sixty hertz, right? Yeah. So the six. So the thing is, above fifty hertz, your eyes can no longer discern. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't. So it's basically the same as constant light. So the forty hertz flicker, you can t tell it's flickering. Right. It's ah. almost. It's 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 very fast, but it's almost like twinkling light. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So the unfortunate thing was that, um, after the three months evaluation of that study, COVID nineteen pandemic happened. Ah. So uh, we were not able to bring the people back at nine months um, time point. So we published the paper just based on the three months um, evaluation. Um, and at three months, you know, we uh, we saw already, we could see a signal by volumetric MRI that the brain atrophy um, seemed to be slowed by the treatment, by the active treatment, you know, so we compare the active group versus the control group in terms of the ventricle size and hippocampal volume. So the brain atrophy appeared to be slowed. Um, and also we saw actually improved fMRI connectivity um, in a couple of different neural network um, uh, mm -hmm. circuits. So, um, but you know, when we use like an AMSE or some other sort of commonly used CDR, ADOS COG, uh, we didn't see um, a signal. Um, and we think that three months is just too soon to yeah. see a cognitive effect. Yeah. So we published that paper um, last year. And, and now we actually um, have some participants from the original, a study who continue to turn on the device every day until today. So we have participants that have been on the trial for close to four years now. And, um, and we actually are very glad that we have these people because, you know, again, knowing the history of Alzheimer's disease drugs, a lot of them, you know, they seem to have effects in the first six months and then you know you don't actually see a protective effect anymore um like the or so something are you like are you going to be able to evaluate the, the cognitive no we, we already evaluated them we have some very exciting results those people who stay on for this entire time their um cognitive, cognitive decline is um extremely well uh, protected. The, the, the decline is extremely slow uh, compared to the you know historical data because we don't have control anymore. Everyone is switched to yeah. to the active group. Okay, so so that's our MIT very small trial, and uh, Conito um, they are uh, phase two. Um, they enrolled about um, eighty or hundred people, and um, I think it was 80. And their patient population is actually more advanced Alzheimer's. They they enrolled mild to moderate Alzheimer's uh, patients. You know, the population that right now, no one is testing them whatsoever. Everybody's going earlier and earlier. But the Carnito just stay with the mild, mild to moderate um, AD patients. Um, so their trial was for six months um the phase two trial and um and they show um amazing 
it's actually quite amazing. They show like um uh, um eighty percent slowing in uh brain volume loss, and also eighty something percent slowing in AMSC, um, and ADSL like a functional daily functionality. Um, and is that is that published? I think their paper is in press. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, extremely promising or encouraging results. So, oh, that's, so that's considered a phase two or three? Phase two, phase two. Phase two. So the FDA actually granted them uh, a breakthrough um, device designation. So we'll have an accelerated track yeah. uh, of evaluation. And they are now uh, recruiting uh, patients for phase three. So their target is to enroll 500 patients, uh, mild to moderate, um, and their trial period will be for one year of uh, daily treatment. Um, and I should also say their device is very different from the MIT device. So we use a light box and they have a like um, goggles kind of device. Um, mm -hmm. They call it gamma sense. So the goggles will produce light, and then there are also earbuds to uh, produce um, auditory uh, stimulation. So, so yeah. So we'll see. Keep my fingers crossed. Okay. Well, they're going the fancy kind of technology. Well, it's easier. Let me say right. So yeah. if people travel, they can easily bring. Ah goes everywhere uh, sure sure yeah. Yeah, yeah and they can do their stimulation anywhere, anywhere. right they don't yeah. have to be at home yeah, yeah 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 that makes sense wow cool <laughs> but the, the, the encouraging thing i would say is even though they use very different device from ours and clearly different populations but we saw very similar results so that's very encouraging yeah. Um, and now you, Mark, you can also see that there's emerging literature. A lot of people are doing different human studies and animal studies. And, you know, people reported a lot of encouraging positive results to using gamma. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the intermittent fasting story, you know, we did all this work beginning in the 90s in animals, then we're involved in some of the first clinical trials. And now there's, if you go on clinicaltrials.gov and you put in intermittent fasting, there's over 200 ongoing clinical trials in various wow. disorders. We we did one at the NIA. It's submitted for publication in, in people at risk for cognitive impairment and AD because of their age and metabolic status. So these were people between 55 and 70 with obesity and insulin resistance, right? And we saw some beneficial effects of just two months of intermittent fasting in them. So, ah, oh, I was gonna mention. So what, one of the last papers we published before I retired, I had a postdoc who was a good electrophysiologist and he, so he maintained uh, mice on either ad lib or in, in, every other day intermittent fasting for different time periods and then made hippocampal slices and he recorded inhibitory postsynaptic currents from CA1 hippocampal neurons. So he's recording the GABA mm -hmm. activity and he found within two weeks and, and it was very clear by a month, there's an increase in GABA tone. Wow. So the intermittent fasting is enhancing GABA tone. Um, That's super interesting. I think it would be really, you know, helpful to understand how does intermediate fasting leading to increased ga uh, GABA tone? Is this through, you know, almost surely metabolic uh, regulation? But we, we have some evidence that it actually involves the mitochondria. Right. Oh, mitochondria. Yeah, there's a or, there's a protein called SIRT3, SIRT2 and 3. Yeah. It's a deacetylase. And so he did this in it was a we had a nature communications paper. So he did this also in SIRT3 deficient mice. And and they're 
their response to intermittent fasting is impaired. Oh, wow. Oh, have you, the at, have you looked at, so you, you found and you looked at tests of learning and memory and your mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. Did you look at tests of anxiety? Because we found that intermittent fasting, it kind of makes sense. If you enhance GABA, the, the first drugs used to treat anxiety disorders was GABA receptor agonists, like diazepam. And anyway, have you looked at gamma stimulation and tests of like anxiety levels in the mind? Yeah, actually, that's almost the first thing we do before we do any of the learning or ah, memory tests. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we definitely see that there's reduced anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. It's like... You know, it's almost just like a meditation effect. <laughs> well, or or exercise effect. Exercise yeah, exercise effect. effect too. Yeah. It's interesting, all these things. So that exercise increases gamma. I don't know about the intermittent fasting. Maybe you could do that. Yeah. It's that very was, easy. This every other fascinating month. to test. It's really easy to do. You just go one day you remove the food from the cage, the next day you put it back. The next day you remove it. So actually, I make this joke all the time. It's a good good project for a graduate student because they have to go in every day to the lab to either add food or remove food. Okay. So they have That's to be great. there. We just have to get the protocol approved. You know, MIT takes forever for animal protocol. Any new it, it will be easy to, to get approved. approved. It will be easy to get approved. Okay. Okay, yeah, we'll try that. Okay, that'd be good. Um, okay, so let's see. Any anything else before we we quit? Anything else exciting uh, in your kind of um, near future horizon in terms of yeah, basic, so obviously, basic or clinical? Yeah, so. Um... First of all, you know, as you can see, this gamma rhythm um, is, you know, very fundamental. So, um, so obviously, we are also looking at its potential effects on other diseases, um, other than Alzheimer's and Down syndrome. Um, you know, we we are looking at like um, Parkinson's disease and. Um, and demyelination diseases. So one thing that we noticed um, is that it has a very strong effect on um, um, protecting myelination. Um, so even in Alzheimer's model, we can see, you know, the white matter volume is very well preserved. Um, so, so are you going to do multiple sclerosis then model or patients? So right now we have a, a Kruposo model. Um, that's a very fast demyelination model. And we show that um, the gamma simulation is very protective. And uh, we, we we like to supplement that with some other uh, demyelination uh, like models. EAE, where you give the... Yeah, something like that. The myelin and, peptide. Yeah. yeah, so basically what we saw is that um, this stimulation can protect oligodendrocytes survival um, and also can promote uh, new oligodendrocytes differentiation. Um, so, um, so, so the yeah, Cooper, so it, the Cooper zone is interesting. So it's essentially copper. Right. And so copper, always, copper like iron. I'm writing a third book now. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's on um, this thing, hormesis adaptive stress responses. And I have a chapter on evolution. And so I'm, I'm getting off topic a little, but that's the way my brain works. So <laughs> um, the earliest life we think on earth was bacteria-like organisms. They were in these deep ocean volcanic vents and there's very high levels of iron there and copper and so iron and copper are very toxic you know uh, in the ionic form but it was the advantage of these organisms to be able to tolerate 
these toxic metals, and then also use them to their advantage. So now we have proteins that incorporate iron or copper. If we don't have enough iron or copper, it's not good for our health. So you have something that's toxic, but now it's we use it, evolution has figured out how to use it. But anyway, so this Cooper zone, we, we actually used that once in one study we did. And it's interesting, it's copper, which induces oxidative stress. And that, that's how it causes damage, I think, to the oligodendrocytes. And then eventually leading to phoroptosis of oligodendrocytes. Yeah, yeah. and so that this gamma is protecting against like a very generic type right. of generic type of stress. Yeah. That's yeah. why I think it can have indications in many uh yeah. different disorders. So yeah, so I'm very um excited um about this. And you know, my lab will continue to to focus on mechanisms. We really want to understand how how does this work. I think that is and right. then what, what, what about acute brain insults then, like uh, traumatic brain injury or stroke, where you know so, <laughs> the big problems with oxidative stress, um, energy failure, that kind of thing? Yeah, I know there are already a couple of papers published on protective effect of gamma on stroke oh. by other labs, um, and I think there there may be also some TBI papers. So, um, so yeah, there are quite a lot of people working on this now. Um, you know, once people realize, you know, you don't, you know, really need to do this implantation or whatever, you can just use light and sound to control the the synchrony in the brain. More and more people are doing it now. So, um, so now that's this is this exciting. is great. This is what's needed. Something that's you know very safe, and down the road, it's something that could be very inexpensive in theory, you know, um, non-invasive. And... So let's see what happens. Let's, fingers crossed, right? Yes, fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, Li Wei, I'll let you get back uh, to your lab. And what's the, the most fun thing about labs is working with the young, you know, students and postdocs who they keep your our energy level up, right? Yes, exactly. That's why I um, enjoy going to the lab, talking to people in the yeah. lab, talking about, you know, just discuss hypotheses, brainstorms. Um, I love. Yeah, I, I do miss. That's one thing. I, that's research. one thing I do miss a lot. Uh, but. What I'm doing now is substituting a little bit for that, right? Yeah. Podcast. Yeah. yeah, thank you for doing this, Mark. Okay, Li Wei. Have a good holiday season. You too, Mark. Bye. Great to catch up with you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.